and let's say let's let's use easy numbers the seller wants ten thousand down okay great we're going to sign that contract and we're going to buy the house on the other end when you do a lease option you take a down payment right a down payment that's actually the option fee so it's not a down payment yet but it's a fee for them to secure the property as a lease option so usually i get i ask for 10 percent down um, from a, a tenant buyer so that i use that 10 percent down to fuel my entry fee on my creative deals Welcome to episode seven of the Real Estate Junkie podcast. Today, we're joined by Tim Yu, an Army officer and real estate rising star. Fresh from his feature on the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie podcast, Tim is shaking up the market with innovative financing methods like seller financing and lease options. So, join us as we dive into the strategies he's propelling on his swift rise in real estate. Tim, welcome to my show. Hey, man. I appreciate you bringing me on. I love connecting with fellow vets um, and kind of talking about real estate, man. So it's awesome. Appreciate your time, man. Yeah, man. You you were recently on the Bigger Pockets uh, Real Estate Rookie Podcast. What was that, back in like November or something? Yeah. So uh, it went live in November, but we actually recorded that episode back in April 2023. Oh, um, wow. So even when that episode coming out in November – you know, a lot of things changed, you know, from April to November. Um, so yeah, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. It was awesome being on the show. Yeah, I think at that point, you were like, you had done eight units, you purchased eight units within like a year or something. Yep. So we did uh, eight, eight long term rentals or midterms, like in that combination. Um, and then I did that was my I was on my second flip during that time when we were recording. Um, so uh, we, we've done a little more, a little bit more deals later on as time progressed, but yeah, when we recorded that episode, I was on eight doors. Nice. And you like, I remember listening to it and you had just like tried pretty much every different creative strategy you could, you could try right from sub to seller financing. Um, and you were just like, t at that point, I think maybe just test driving different strategies, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think a lot of investors kind of change their their strategies as things go on. Like, you know, I, I tell people when I first started, like I didn't really know a lot of things, and I thought, you know, twenty percent down, or you know, I didn't even really understand the VA loan to be honest. Uh, like my first primary residence, I didn't even use the VA loan. So, you know, you can be everyone starts off with their first deal with their first house and and I bought mine with 20% down and and then you know we talked about how I you know use my retirement money to buy other properties and then eventually I ran out of money right so um and then how do you scale from there so that's when I went down the rabbit hole of like creative finance and yeah man it's 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 life changing stuff man for sure it's crazy it is it is and and what you're doing now we talked a little bit about it before this podcast and I can't wait to like really dive into it here. Um, but what we'll start with is let's just hear more about you. Like you, right now you're an active duty army officer, right? Yes, sir. So what, how, 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 first off, how long have you been in the army? Man, I think October of 2023, I hit my nine year mark. So I'm like at that, like that halfway point where you got to decide, you know, what you're going to yeah. do. Um, I'm, I'm 31. I've been in the army for, you know, almost a decade. I'm in a weird situation now. So I'm in like grad school now. So like the army sent me to grad school for a year. Um, so that kind of like gave me some flexibility to do real estate. But when I graduate school, I'll owe two more years um, of active duty service. And then we'll see two years from now where I'm going to be at. Um, but the goal is to either get out of active duty completely, which is the, which is the number one goal. But I don't know if I'm going to go reserves or not afterwards. 
but I do want to do this thing full time, man. Like this is like the thing that I love to do, like my new passion, right? Yeah. Um, because I I know a lot of service members, you know, they're kind of in the funk, right? They're they go to their job, they go train, they go deploy, whatever it is, and it's like, you know, you're not you are serving the country and you are serving a greater purpose, but you're not really serving yourself. Yeah. Um, so I feel like when I found real estate, you know, it's something that is serving myself and my family, you know, so that's why Absolutely. it's like that new passion. Yeah. You know, it's crazy because I talk with a lot of, I have a lot of friends that are still serving and, um, you know, I have one friend in particular, he's, he's about to retire as a Lieutenant Colonel. Now mm -hmm. he actually started out enlisted when all made it all the way up to E seven, then yeah. became a second lieutenant and worked his way up to lieutenant colonel. And now he's like on the verge of retiring after like 27 years in service. But guess what? He doesn't own a single property. He, mm -hmm. he wasn't, he wasn't, he could have been building something along the way. And so like, literally I helped him purchase his first house hack as a lieutenant colonel. It's pretty crazy when That's you think crazy, about it. Man. And then you look at like someone like you and I've, I've talked to other, like I'm working with someone right now that's 25 years old and they already have like five properties under their belt and they every duty station they've been just accumulating properties so you definitely have advantages being active duty or just being a veteran in general when it comes to real estate um the va loan is powerful uh the fact that you get to go to all these different locations and live there for a little bit and a lot of times like depending on where you where you're from, you may be in an area of the country where it's a lot less to get into real estate or maybe the opposite, but you'll have multiple opportunities to do it. So I think it's really cool that you were able to like basically bump into real estate in the first place. So when did that happen? How did that happen? Man, I actually love what you just said, right? That kind of segments into this this question here you know, moving to different places and the cost of living, right? Like in the real estate world, you start meeting a lot of people from all over the place. And, you know, I've met some people in California. They're like, man, I can't get started out here. It's like a million dollars to buy like a one bedroom house. <laughs> so, it is, um, yeah. you know, I, I had the fortunate um, experience of moving to Kentucky, uh, Louisville, Kentucky to be exact. And uh, Fort Knox, Fort Knox, baby, right? The gold vault. Um, you know, it's very affordable here compared yeah. to other places. So I, I grew up in New York. Um, you know, the same house that I bought now that I live in um, would be like $600,000 at home, right? That, that's ridiculous, right? So I bought this house for 250. Same exact house, same exact square footage, it'd be half a million or more. Um, but yeah, so, so basically the story was I PCS to Louisville, Kentucky in 2021. And I lived in a 600 square foot apartment downtown for $1,400 a month. Um, I had to pay an extra hundred dollars for an old garage parking spot because you don't want to park like on the street. Um, so I'm paying, you know, an arm and leg for rent that had some crazy neighbors above me, super loud. And oh my gosh, like it was just horrible. So about two months before my lease expired, I went down to the uh, leasing office and was like, hey, how can I break my lease or when do I have to tell you? And the lady goes, well, why are you leaving? I want to buy a house. I don't want to pay rent anymore. And she's like, well, that's funny. Like, do you have a real estate agent? I'm like, I don't. And she's like, well, my friend is right around the corner. And my real estate agent literally walks around the corner and was like, hey, I'm an agent. You want to go find a house? And I'm like, yeah, great. So we found a house, got a house under contract in like seven days. Um, it was the height of the craziness. Yeah. So it was 2022. Yeah. So I bought my house in like January 2022, where it was like a bidding war. And I think that's why I didn't use my VA loan. So people were like denying offers that were VA, you know what yeah. I mean? They would only yeah. take conventional. So I threw that aside and my agent was like, Hey, how bad do you want this house? And would you be sad if you didn't get it? And I was like, yeah, I, I'd be upset. So then I foregoed my VA loan and went conventional. So that's, that's kind of what happened to me. Um, after that, I talked to her, my agent who owns rental properties herself. She's an Airbnb person. And I said, Hey, how'd you get started? Um, what resources should I go to, you know? And so she showed me a real estate meetup in locally, started going there. And then obviously she introduced me to bigger pockets. So I listened to the rookie podcast for like a year straight driving to Fort Knox every single day, uh, two hours a day. And 
it was like November of 2022. I was walking in the park with my then girlfriend at the time, now married, but uh, she, it was like Thanksgiving and I was on Zillow and she was like, hey man, like, like get off your phone for a second, you know? And, and I'm like, okay, okay. And I see this house, $100,000 and it reduced to 50 grand overnight. So I looked at the pictures, it looked good, like structurally. So I called my agent that I use when I bought my primary. I said, let's go see it tomorrow. So I went to go see it and I made a cash cash offer right there on the spot. I was like, I'll buy it for 40 grand. Real quick on that house, you paid 40K to snatch it up. Did you bar? so you borrowed the funds for that 40K? Yeah, so this one was a hard money loan. So I listened to a podcast back and it was like, hey, if you're doing a flip or a burr, um, use hard money. So <clears throat> what I did was I YouTubed it, watched like 10 hours of what hard money was. And every single meetup I went to um, in my market here, the Louisville one was I'm looking for pr hard money loans. Like who would loan money? And, and obviously like a lot of people didn't want to loan money to me because my first deal and it was under a hundred K. So a lot yeah. of them won't make a lot of money off it. So they're like, there's like kind of no point. Yeah. Um, but there was one lender that was like, Hey, you know, you got, you got money saved up. You have a good income. Like, we'll take a chance on you. Um, you know, no skin off our nose to lend you, you know, 80 grand. Right. Cause 60, yeah. it was like 40 to renovate or 40 to buy and like 20 something to renovate the property. So that's how I got that deal. So how did you go about finding the people to renovate the project? Like, did you do the work yourself? <laughs> Man, I, I, you know, you hear these horror stories, man. Uh, I I experienced them. So the guy definitely knew that I was a rookie. Kind of like, you know, price gouged me a little bit. I went with him because he was the cheapest. So that was the big mistake right there. Um, you know, if, if there was any feedback that I can give, you know, listeners when they're first starting is do not take the cheapest contractor. Yeah. Pay the extra money for someone reputable and has good, like, you know, testimonies or whatever it is. But um, I ended up paying way more on the back end, redoing a lot of the work that yes. was really shoddy the first time. And he literally, you know, you hear the horror stories of contractors leaving, like towards the end of the project. Mm -hmm. I made the mistake of paying him like that last third and he literally disappeared. So me and my wife literally was painting the house ourselves, trying to get it ready. <laughs> um, hours of, of my life wow. just in that kitchen. Right. So yeah, that, I think that was horrible. But I think finding good contractors is kind of like trial and error. You know, you, you start off with finding subcontractors like, hey, I'm mm -hmm. trying to connect with floor people. I'm trying to connect with window people. And then eventually you start, you know, the more deals you do and the more reputation you have, you feel more comfortable and yeah. better contractors want to do stuff with you. Um, so now, you know, I have two GCs in Louisville that, you know, when I call them for a project, they're like, let's go, let's go renovate this property and you buy them and I flip them. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's, you know, it's, there's no, I guess like easy button for finding contractors. It's like, there's you just not, gotta get, you just gotta I mean, gamble. honestly, I have a saying that I always say it's uh shortcuts cut profits. It's, and it's true. I, I think we've all, you know, like my, part of my stories, I, I really got into burr. I got on the, the, mm -hmm. the burr bug and um, I just started going after really ugly homes and fixing them up. But I learned so many things about, you know, because I, I mean, when you first start out, you're trying to create as much profit as possible. So you are going to take some shortcuts. You're going to go with the cheapest guy. But I can tell you what, the cheapest guy is going to burn you. 100% of the time you want somebody that has experience knows what they're doing you want to call their references you want to see the homes that they've actually worked on all this stuff is so important I know with man. contractors I I've I probably you end up spending way more than you thought you were going to save by taking that shortcut in the beginning so definitely great advice I'm glad now though, you have a network of solid contractors, probably handymen as well. You know, oh, we yeah. all need, you all, everyone needs a good handyman because there are a lot of things you don't need an actual contractor for, right? And for you to go in there with your wife and put floors in and paint, it's just a complete waste of your time and you're probably not gonna do that good of a job anyway, right? That's the so, thing. Yeah, so if you can find a good handyman to do that stuff, like I have three on deck all the time 
you know, and they're all really good. And I pay them. They always like, you know, cause I give them so much work. They're like, ah, oh, man, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You know, 200 bucks, you know, and I'll paint yep. the house. I'm like, are you kidding me? 200? No, I'm not going to let you, I'm going to pay <laughs> no you 600 yeah, bucks yeah, yeah. and you're going to paint the house, you know? So yeah, man, that's, that's good. So you built up a network there. Um, so that was your second property, right? Yep. Yep. So, so what did you end up doing with that one? Yeah, originally it was supposed to be a burr. Uh, I wanted to do my first long-term rental and the project took so long. It took, you know, two, three months longer with, you know, the bad contracting and stuff like that. And, and, and I do want to say this too, is like, I think a lot of us, we blame the contractor, right? I think that the more you do these projects, you start to realize that it really is on you as the investor because you're the project manager, right? Technically. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, now like, you know, I structure, you know, three, four payments and like there's a list of things that we want to get done before I pay you out. Right. It's a lot more organized. When my first deal, I was like, yeah, just do what you think has to be done. <laughs> like it's such a difference. Right. Yeah. Like, Cause you didn't know. You don't know yeah. what you don't know. I'm like, yeah, the bathroom needs done. Like new <laughs> floor. Right. Like cool. But now it's like you have a plan in your head. Like when yeah. you go through a property, you like know what you want to do, you know. Um, and, and the recent thing that I learned is like, I'm going to bring a designer in before yeah. I re do any flips. Right. Um, I didn't do a designer this time and I brought her in at the very end and I spent the extra $7,000 to redo everything. And my gosh, like it's a big difference. Right. Um, so I would recommend doing a designer for doing a flip, get her, Absolutely. get him or her in there, pay the thousand, two thousand dollar consultation fee. You're going to save a ton of money on the back end. You you are even with a burr, like if you have no idea what you're going to do to the kitchen or bathroom, it's going to look horrible when it gets done. I don't care. You, you could have the best contractor in the world there. They're going to do what you tell them. And if you're like, just make it look good. It's not going to end up good. So, yeah, I totally agree. I, I have a designer out here, too, that just, hey, man, this is what I'm thinking. Tell me if I'm crazy make some suggestions, you know? Yeah. Give me the price differences, right? Give me the yes. high tier, give me the mid tier, like, you know what yes. I mean? So, um, but yeah, so it was originally supposed to be a bird, took a long time, uh, realized, man, I really don't want the property. It wasn't in the best of neighborhoods. Um, and I knew I didn't want to like have those type of tenants or problems al along with that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so I ended up trying to sell it and then we barely made a profit. So I think I cleared like $5,000 in six months, um, which is a horrible spread when, when you add time to it. But the lessons I learned is invaluable, right? Like it's made all my renovation projects way better just because I know what I don't want to do. I know what I don't like to do. And I know what's effective when I talk to contractors, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I had that $5,000 profit at the end of the day. Didn't even make a dent in my taxes. <laughs> so... Um, hey, you know what, on. though? You know what? Like, you might look at that as a failure, but honestly, I think it was a success because look at what you gained. You gained the experience of going through it. You you were able to build your network of contractors and everything else, which probably made your third property, your first fourth property that much more successful. So it really sets you up for success. 100%. I personally, if you don't have a failure in real estate, you're, you're, you're doomed for one. Like you, you may have gotten <laughs> extremely lucky on that first property, but I tell you what, that second or third one, you're going to get burned. You need to have a failure. So if you fail early on, you're going to have a much better path. Oh yeah. I mean, dude, we're, we're failing like all the time, right? Like, you know, yeah. you could be on your 10th, 12th, 13th deal and you know, something wrong goes like, you know, I think every investor, like uh, I was listening to like Tarek El Musa, whatever, he flips like a thousand houses or whatever. And he, even he was like, man, I still mess up on my deals, man. You just never know what's under the hood when you yeah. buy that car and you start ripping open walls and you're like, great, like everything's rotted out. You know, that was not in your original budget. Um, I would say, hey, if you're going to flip a house or renovate a house, you know, never, it never goes to plan. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. I, I just did a podcast with John Crutchfield and he's done hundreds of properties. Like he's, he's doing big things. And I asked him, I'm like, hey. Can you tell me a story of, you know, something that you 
a mistake that you made that if you could go back, you would, you would change it. And he basically says, man, I made a mistake this morning. <laughs> you know, he goes, I continue to make mistakes. And because of that, I'm successful. So yep, there you go. All right. Awesome. So third, let's talk about third property, fourth property, how you eventually like got into seller financing, because I know you've done a few of those deals now, and we're going to talk specifically what you're doing with them. But I want to hear more about how you bumped into seller financing and even explain to the listeners that may not even know what that is. I mean, I've talked about it on some of my previous podcasts. I've used it, but maybe you can explain that to the listeners if they're like, seller, what is that? Like, yeah. break it down. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> let's let's start with the explanation first, I guess. So seller finance is the easiest way I can explain it is when the seller becomes the bank. So instead of going to the bank to do a 30-year mortgage and you pay a down payment, whatever it is, you know, that seller becomes the actual bank. So we create an actual mortgage with the seller and we pay the seller over time, right? So all the bank rates, so like interest rates, down payment, you know, amount of years you pay the seller, it's all negotiable. Um, the reason why seller finance is so awesome is because we can literally make any deal cash flow. We can make any deal work, right? Doesn't matter what's going on in the market, you know, seven and a half percent interest rate for an investor right now. Yeah, screw that, right? Like I have a deal where I'm paying zero percent interest to the seller. Um, really? For, zero percent? Zero percent, man. $250 payments every single month for five years and then we balloon. So we, so balloon payments is when you owe the rest of the principal to the seller. So we did a five year balloon, but the whole point of it was we were going to renovate the property and only have a $250 holding cost per month. Oh, that's huge. It's that's crazy, huge. Right. Um, yeah. we, and the purchase price was 150. There was a house across the street that sold for 385. So it's a massive equity play and we're not pressured. You know, we bought the house maybe a month or two ago. We just started renovating like recently because we were just paying two fifty a month. You know, it's not, no stress at all. Um, we're gonna rent it out for you know fourish years, and then we're going to do a refinance with the bank and pay back the seller and pay back our our private money lender that actually loaned us the money to do the repairs. Um, and we'll still have about a hundred k in equity in the deal. So, did, now, now, did you? In order to talk the seller into offering 0%, obviously the house is run down, so there's really nothing that they're able to do with it unless they fix it up. So the, you stepped in and go, look, hey, it's going to take us some time to fix it up, so offer, give us this 0%. But did you pay more than it was maybe worth in that condition in order to get those terms? Yeah, I, I'd probably say the house you know, in the current condition is probably like 130000 um, so he got an extra twenty thousand uh, dollars. It's just going to be delayed, and that is like kind of like a selling point that we can give sellers. Like, hey, you're going to get more money over time. It's mm -hmm. just going to be over time. And then also the second thing is tax things. So if he sold it as is for one thirty, that's a hundred and thirty thousand. Or I think he was going to make sixty thousand dollars of you know capital gains. Mm -hmm. Now he's not going to pay that tax. So he's going to pay that tax over time. Cause we're paying them 250 a month you know what i mean so you know there's there's benefits on that side is one you get paid more money over time you get that purchase price that they want the second is they have tax to, they have tax incentives to do a seller finance deal and i would say that you know the conversation that i had with this particular seller was he had a ton of wholesalers calling him and giving him like 70 80 thousand dollar cash offers yeah. And he's like, I'm not, it's in a beautiful neighborhood, right? So he knew yeah. that like it was worth something if you renovated it. So he didn't want to give it away for free. So when I called him, he, I think he said on, on the recorded call, cause I had it posted on my Instagram. He said, I had about 26 calls this week about this property and I'm going to sell it to you because you're actually listening to what I'm saying. You know that I don't want that $70,000 offer and you're not even going to give it to me. You're not even going to offer it. I just said, what price do you want? And let me see if I can meet that. And he said, 150, right? That's all I care about. I don't care if I get it now. I don't care if I get it down the road. So I said, how long are you willing to take this loan? He goes, if you can pay me in five years, we got a deal. And then we did the wow. math, talked to my partner, put out the gonculator, 
hey, how much equity are we going to get from this and blah, blah, blah. And, and it ended up working out like we saw the comps of the houses sold down the road and all this stuff. And we're like, hey, let's do it. We'll close in, in two weeks. Um, nice. And that's also a big thing, too. When you close creatively, you can close fast, right? Because yeah. we only I think we only gave them like 10000 down. So nice. for ten thousand dollars, we bought a, a house that's going to make us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. And so, how did you find this seller? Yeah, so this was off market. Um, it was pitched by a wholesaler, and the wholesaler had it way too high. I think she, I think he or she got it for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars cash. So that means they probably got it for the one twenty of what that guy was asking for, and then they tried to wholesale it, and they mentioned that the contract was going to expire soon because they couldn't get a buyer. So I messaged them and said, hey, would you be willing for me to talk to the seller for you? And they left me on red and they just let the deal fall. So then I eventually, four days later, when the contract expired, I just called the seller. I said, hey, I heard that you had a, you were under contract. What happened? And the guy was like, well, the seller just go or the buyer just ghosted me. And I said, okay, great. Like, I'm not a wholesaler, so you don't have to worry about me flaking out on you. If I give you a contract, I'm going to buy this house. Do you want to talk? And he's like, absolutely. Let's do it. So that's how that conversation started where wow. you know, I said, hey, I'm not a wholesaler, dude. Like, I know that's what you're dealing with, and I'm going to give you a solution, and I'm going to take that property off your hands. And that's pretty much – that's what it was all about, man, just solving problems. Did this seller even know about seller financing, or did you have to educate them about it a little bit? Uh, so he was actually a little bit familiar. Um, he understood okay. the idea of it. Like, okay, so you owe me money over time. And, you know, I, I always kind of tell the seller, like, well, what's in it for me, right? And I'm like, well, it, it's, you know, I'm not going to sell you on the idea, but I'm going to tell you the perks of it. Like, you know, if I go to the bank and I borrow $150,000 to buy this house, especially if it's a hard money loan, I'm going to be paying 12% interest. You're not going to get that interest. I'm losing 12% interest. Like who wins? It's the bank or the, or the money lender. I said, why not, why not make a deal where you're happy and I'm happy and the only people getting paid is us two, right? And then, you know, he, he just wanted to know like the real intricacies of it. Like, hey, how are we going to structure the deal? How does the paperwork look? And luckily in Louisville, like we have a title company with a bunch of closing attorneys that are familiar with creative finance. So, and it's a very well-known title company. So when you talk to sellers in Louisville, they're like, Hey, we're going to close at borders and borders. Right. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, great. I know that title company. Like I feel comfortable with that. Right. So it gives you that little credibility when you're pitching creative deals. A lot of the times the seller is just looking for your credibility. Are you going to scam me? Are you going to disappear on me? What happens if you don't pay me? Right. Yeah. So you have to have kind of like all those steps in your brain to kind of negotiate with the seller to make them feel at ease. And you never want to pressure the seller. You know, like I tell the seller, like, it's your house is your decision. If nothing comes to fruition between us, I just want us to depart as friends. Right. And they're like, wow, okay, that's really refreshing. Right. And really, though, like, you just have to listen to the seller and you have a way better chance of converting that lead. How do I go about finding a deal that I could potentially pitch seller financing and win? Oh man, that's that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think there's two ways, right? Obviously, there's two main ways to find deals. You're either on the market or you're off the market. And if you're on the market, I usually say this. So if you look on Zillow, like you can find deals on Zillow. Like I talk about this all the time. Filter out houses that have been on the market for over 90 days and i say 90 days because it's there's been some pain right the mm -hmm. seller can't sell the house or the agent can't sell it whatever it is and you call those leads like there's a lot of people that i know that try to call houses that just listen on the market and it's like dude they're confident in their house that's going to sell yeah. so i think it's a waste of time if you call agents or for sale by owners that have houses over 90 days they've already experienced some sort of pain so when you're talking to these agents and talking to these sellers, like, hey, I'm very interested in the house. I have the ability to give your seller the purchase price that they're looking for if they're open to talking terms. Mm -hmm. And then that question is like, what is terms? 
right? What do you mean? Now, now you're in the now you're in the game, right? You, well, you have agents that say like, oh no, we're not interested, and we're not interested. Yeah, but yeah. some agents will say like, well, what do you mean? Like, let's p- pitch what you got, right? Like, and then you kind of tell the agent up front, no matter what deal we structure, I'm gonna pay you. You're gonna get your commission. Yeah. Because I I rather have a happy agent paid that now knows that I can close creative deals. And now I'm going to be like, hey, Mr. Agent, do you have any listings that are about to expire that you want to get paid on? That's that's a great strategy. Yeah. And also, when you the next time you you have one of these properties that you, you can't sell for whatever reason, give me a call. I'll you know? buy it. <laughs> I'll buy it. Yeah. And you I'll built pay that you. relationship. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. So now you've also, in our conversation before we started re- Recording this podcast, we talked a little bit about one of the strategies that you're using right now with lease options. So can you talk about what you're doing with lease options, what that does for you, and how that's benefiting some of these seller financing deals that you're um, getting into? Yeah, I, I, I really love lease options. I know we had an hour-long conversation we, before we this about it because uh, <laughs> it's, it's awesome, right? It, it, it not only is a way for us to enter deals with low money or no money down. Um, but also you're giving the opportunity to a buyer that wouldn't normally be able to buy a house, right? Because we help them build their credit. They live in a house. They they really believe that it's their house because it will be, right? If you, if you structure the deal correctly, it will be their house. Um, if for people that don't know a lease option, it, it literally is sounds just like that. They sign a lease and they rent the property out from you. And then they also have the option to purchase the house from now to a set amount of time. So what I usually do is I want the seller or I want the buyer to actually perform on the option and buy it. So I give them five years. What I do is like I give them a three-year initial and then I'll allow them to extend two more years if they show me that they're continuing to build their credit and they're actively interested in trying to buy it. Because you don't want to lock yourself up too long if they're not motivated Um, so I give them a three year term with the ability to extend to five. And if they don't buy the house in five years, like, I don't really know, like, (laughs) like that's a lot of time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the benefits of it, like, let's say we get a seller finance deal. Um, and let's say, let's, let's use easy numbers. The seller wants 10,000 down. Okay, great. We're going to sign that contract and we're going to buy the house. On the other end, we do a lease option. You take a down payment right? A down payment. That's actually the option fee. So it's not a down payment yet, but it's a fee for them to secure the property as a lease option. So usually I get, I ask for 10% down um, from a, a tenant buyer so that I use that 10% down to fuel my entry fee on my creative deals, right? So now it may not cover it all. It may not whatever, but I'm getting into that house for minimal money down yeah, or no money down at all. And then the tenant moves in, they pay rent. And then the lux- the luxurious thing about a lease option is the tenant buyer actually can charge the maintenance. So whatever cash flow you have truly is, in my opinion, cash flow. Passive. And passive. Right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. They don't they don't bother me. They're happy to fix things because they know they're gonna buy the house. And nine out of ten times, they know that the house is gonna be theirs, so they tend to take care of it. Like they're mm-hmm. not going to kick holes in the wall. They're not going to do this stuff. Like if you screen them right and you and you talk to them and they're really good people, they're not going to kick holes in your wall. So they're going to take care of the property. They're going to – it's truly passive. They're happy to do the work. Um, and you got the house for free. Right? So are you giving them an option to buy the house for more than you've purchased the property yourself, right? You're, you're marking it up, correct? Yes, yes, because you're building in the appreciation – of the five years. So you're like, okay, look, we're going to set you on a path because maybe they have poor credit, but they have, you know, $10,000 that they can put down, but no bank in the world is going to loan them money. You're giving them a chance to get into this house and you, and, and you look at it and you go, Hey, look, it's going to take you three to five years to get yourself in a situation where you can qualify with, for a bank. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the price of this purchase of what this house would be in three to five years, right? So you're basically building that in from the very beginning and 
taking in that option deposit, using that, you already have the house under contract with the seller. You haven't closed yet, so you haven't paid them any money yet. Then you use that option as your down payment and you set it up so that the rents are paying are are more than the seller financing monthly note, right? Yep. So your cash flowing. Do you have a minimum like cash flow number that you need to be at for these properties? Yeah. So so I try to not try to advertise to a lease option buyer before I close. So like I'll I'll close on the property. Like that's not the problem. So just be aware that like you could have two to three months of holding costs trying to find a tenant buyer, but that's what you have to put into your your math equation when you go into these deals. You know, expect to lose three months, right? If you mm -hmm. can't find one. Mm -hmm. um, but we close in the property, we go at, then we advertise it legally and then we get the tenant in. Um, but for each house, because I'm not doing maintenance, I'd be happy with two to three hundred dollars per door. Yeah, absolutely. Two, that's like that's like four to five hundred dollars a door when you factor in vacancy, maintenance, and all all those other things. Yeah, Correct. absolutely. That's and it's truly passive. That's what I love about it. Um, and then, at worst case scenario, in five years, they walk away, they lose their lease option, then you go find someone else to do it. So. Correct. Uh, and now you now you say, OK, what's this house going to be worth in another five years? Exactly. Um, that's that's beautiful. So are these homes that you're going after now? Like, are you looking for turnkey seller financing deals or are you doing the, the repair, yeah. the rehab and all that as well? I, I definitely don't want to get like houses that are like just absolutely destroyed. Um, definitely want to look for like more cosmetic stuff. Um, you want to make the house lovable. Um, I, I don't want to be a slumlord. I've never been one and I don't choose to be. So, you know, I, I love, you know, when people go to my social media page, they'll see the houses that I, I put on for rent. Right. And they're, they're turnkey. They're when, when, when buyers walk into the house, they're happy. Right. And I want them to be happy, um, happy tenants, happy life. Right. Um, so if I need to do work in the house, it's mostly going to be cosmetic if I'm going to do a lease option. And then also, like, I know we kind of talked about this where, if the market isn't super appreciative, then it's more beneficial for me to do a lease option anyway, right? Yeah. And also yeah. most people can't afford a $500,000 lease option house anyway. So you wanna buy houses that are more on the affordable scale, depending on your market. So in Louisville, like I look for houses under 250 ARV, right? Cause most of our, most of our buyers are in that price bracket. Yeah. Um, don't wanna really go too much higher than that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Like which markets the house is in and, you know, if it's a super appreciative market, then I'm going to keep it as a long-term traditional rental. Um, if it's not super appreciative, like let's do a lease option and like, let's build in some equity. Right. So you, you have two different strategies based on wherever you found the seller financing deal at, you'll look at the neighborhood, you'll look at all these factors and you'll say, do we want to keep this one forever? Or is this one we want to put in the lease option bucket? So where, where do you see yourself in as far as real estate? We know you're kind of on that, on the fence right now with the army. Am I going to, you know, retire? Or am I going to go in the reserves? Yeah. What am I going to do? I know I love real estate. I'm a real estate junkie. <laughs> um, yeah. This is all I can think about and all I want to do. Uh, where do you see yourself though? Say in five years on, in the real estate game anyway. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, man. I, I think I changed my mind every month. <laughs> um, 2024 is the year of the multifamily, man. I'm, uh, I'm not doing flips right now. Well, after these flips I'm selling, so I'm about to list one right now. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a back seat on the active side of it. So I, I want to get on the LP deal right now uh, on a multifamily deal to get some doors under my belt and also just to learn from people doing some bigger deals. I just want to be exposed to it. Um, I don't mind being a passive investor right now. And then eventually, like, I want to start purchasing properties, you know, creatively, you know, seller finance, like, like the Cody Davises, right? Because I listened to that episode, yeah. um, you know, he's a big inspiration where he he's picking up multiple doors for seller finance, right? Zero yeah. down. And it's insane. Yeah. And yeah. I want to get to that level. I, I just feel like I want to be on the more passive side first for the next year or so, just so I can like learn the game, learn the ropes yeah. and. Um, because I know my first year in real estate, I took too much action, I think. Um, and it definitely like burned me a little bit. So I'm learning as I go, right? Because people forget, like, I've only been an investor for 14, 15 months. 
So there's a lot of foundational stuff that I'm missing. So I'm trying to tone it down on the acquisition side, build my foundation, build my portfolio mentally, and then um, we scale from there. Nice. So is there like a quote or mantra that has influenced your real estate journey in life? Yeah, absolutely, man. I, there's a, I know everyone talks about Robert Kiyosaki's book. Um, the book that I'm talking about is Who Not How. Who right? Not How. Who Not How. It is a book about truly delegating and finding the people in your life or in your circle that know what you're trying to do. So like, for instance, let's say I'm trying to flip my house for the first time. Let's go back in time. Um, instead of me doing it myself, why don't I find someone who is a flipping expert or have a lot yeah. of experience and partner with him or partner with her, right? Yeah. yeah. I pay money. I'll pay you money. I'll loan you money, whatever it is, to watch you work, right? Yeah. And hire that who to help you out. And like, for instance, like for, I was talking to my buddy the other day, I spend like three, four hours a month paying my bills, you know, and like, I have a lot of other things I'd rather be doing. So, you know, I just hired a, bookkeeper slash VA to help me pay my bills, right? That's four hours a month I get back in my time where I can spend on my wife, spend it on talking to sellers, talking to investors, right? Your time is worth so much more than, you know, screwing a light in a house, right? It That's is. what we talked about handyman. Yeah. You know, why would I save that $50 when I, would, that would take me two hours to drive there, fix yeah. the light, and I'm not going to do it right. It's going to take me way longer to do it. Just find the who, right? And pay the money, right? Like we all have different values that we can give. You know, those handymen, they have a skill and our value to them is money. So I give them my money. They save me a lot of time. And that time that I've saved makes me way more money in the long run. So I pay them 50 bucks, but I just made, you know, $10,000 on a wholesale deal, right? Exactly. So I think that's you, like... You can't, you can't do everything yourself. You will never succeed. Um, you really do need a village of experts around you. And if you don't know someone that's doing it, you better go find them. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's a common thread. Like ever since the first podcast, a common thread that I keep hearing over and over and over again and i've experienced it in my own life as well it's like i was when i was talking to, to mark kong and his journey he started out wholesaling houses and he learned from somebody that was you know he was calling for them right and eventually started calling for himself dialing for dollars then he locked up a wholesale uh, contract and he could have sold it to any flipper for a lot more money, but he chose to sell it for a lower price to one that could help him basically allow him to shadow her um, where he learned the game. He learned, he learned, he made connections with contractors, all different vendors that could help him with his own flips. And then he started flipping houses. It's so important to surround yourself with people that have successfully done things because you could learn from their mistakes instead oh of making gosh. them yourself. Years of experience, man. Years of experience. You get it all in, in one shot. And, you know, I, I tell people not to chase the bag, right? Like, don't chase yeah. the big numbers. Like, Mark Kong did, did the right thing. He took a little less money up front, but look how much money it's made him in the long run, right? I think yeah. everyone's got to think of, like, the long-term stuff and, you know, think about what value you get over a stretch of time instead of getting that like huge wholesale check. I know it's like super sexy and awesome to see that yeah. big check, yeah. but my gosh, like he's probably made hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, from that one experience he had. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's, it's, it, uh, man, I, I just got done doing a podcast with John Crutchfield and he said the exact same thing. Like it's so important that you just surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. Um, and, and learn from them. So yeah, it's very important. Thank you so much for that advice. As, as we wrap up here, can you share where our listeners can follow your journey or get in touch with you for, for more insights? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm pretty active on social media, um, mostly on Instagram right now. You can find me at it's Tim you. So just like I T S and then my name, find me on Instagram. Um, love to help out some folks get started. Um, we're actually doing a veteran um, webinar 
it's me and my partner. We're going to teach people how to lend money and to raise capital for their own deals. And we just want to help out the veteran community get started because like you and I were talking about, we really feel like there's a lack of education there or is. a lack of exposure for veterans. Like literally 23% of veterans that are eligible use their VA loan. Like that's insane. It is insane. It is insane. Yeah. You barely bumped into real estate like what two, three years ago. You're <laughs> you're making a dent and you're doing big things, and that's just so awesome to see. So keep up the good work. I'm watching you, and so is everyone else. Yeah, hey, I appreciate it, Keith. And and thanks for having me on the show. And and let me know where I can buy some merch, man. I would love to rock a real estate junkie hat. Oh, I'll like, send uh, you one, man. You don't yeah, have to buy it. I'll send you I, one. I feel like we're all real estate junkies, man. So we I, are, I man. It. It's it's definitely addicting. Um, you know, once you get a taste of it, even if you're not so successful on that first one like you were, you got addicted and you're like, okay, now I know what to do and I'm gonna do it better oh, and yeah. bigger. And yeah, man, I've I've definitely caught the bug. I know my wife gets tired of me talking about it all the time because <laughs> no matter what we're talking about, somehow real estate finds its way into the conversation. I just yep. can't help it. Hundred percent, dude. Hey, but I appreciate the time, man. I appreciate you bringing me on the show, and I'm excited to, excited to keep listening and watch you grow as well. Awesome. Thank you so much.